I don't even know what the question was. I'm from West Lafayette, Indiana, which is a small town in Indiana, and now I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. My high school was like a really like rigorous academic school. So we had an art program, but it was like really small. So I did a lot of STEM fields in high school, but I was always doing photo or like art projects on the side. And then I came to Columbia University for engineering um, and I didn't like it. So then I switched to art history because we don't have like a specific like fine arts program. You can study visual arts, but I don't really think a lot like it's not like a, if you're in New York, you should just go to an art school, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So um, yeah, transferring like out of the school wasn't really a option for me. So I just like stayed at Columbia and then I did art history and business. So I have training in like art history, but I don't have like technical photo or art training. I really liked Columbia. Like once I got into the right program, I totally loved it. It's like, a, I think it's a really romantic school because history is amazing. It was founded in 1754, so it's like pre-Revolutionary War. I think that's so cool. Um, and like a lot of my favorite poets and like artists went to Columbia. Like Ben Stein went to Columbia. I think that's so cool. Um, Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, Lucian Carr, like the whole beat thing started at Columbia in the, in the 40s and 50s. So I really liked that like history. And also it's nice to go to school in the city but have a campus and like we have a closed campus and all the architecture, like it makes you feel like you're not necessarily in New York City, but then once you leave campus and like go downtown, then you know you're in Manhattan. So I liked that balance a lot. My dad was always taking pictures and like uh, recording everything on a video camera when my brother and I were young. And so I think I just like grew up with this idea that you document things and like this is a thing that you do for yourself for posterity. It's like a nice thing to do. And when my dad has like so many funny photos, like self portraits of himself when he was in college. Uh, where he's like wearing bell bottoms and like posing on a car and I just grew up seeing all of those and I like found a like connection to documenting things so I think that's like the first time I can recall really taking photos was in fifth grade when I went to this thing called fifth grade camp which is like for a weekend you like go out to the woods with your class and you like stay in little like wooden cabins and go out in the woods and stuff and my parents gave me two disposable cameras for that. Probably starting in like seventh grade, I think it was in seventh grade I asked for like a digital point and shoot um, and I would just like take pictures in my backyard or like whatever of my friends and then in high school I got a, my first DSLR and then it just kind of like got really serious from there. In retrospect, I'm like very fond of where I grew up because it was very boring and it really forced me to like find ways to be creative and find ways to entertain myself. Because like I couldn't go to a museum, I couldn't go to a concert, like for fun we went to the cornfields or we went to Walmart, you know? And like that sounds really hokey when I say it now, but those are the things that we like found pleasure in and like at the time I knew that it was boring, but I also knew that I like had to make what I could with whatever I had around me. And also like now that I live in a metropolitan, I am never bored and I'm always satisfied and I like I don't take any of that for granted. Like even like just the littlest thing or adventure is so exciting to me and I like that because I don't want like the novelty of New York City to ever wear off for me or the novelty of like anywhere in the world. And I think that like relative difference between living in like a, a very small town um, where there was kind of like one school of thought to moving to a place like this. It's like an entirely different world. Yeah. My parents lived in New York in the 80s so when I was growing up we would like come here for vacation. I remember spending maybe like three Christmases in the city and starting from age maybe like 12. And so I was always very taken by New York and like the architecture and all the art, music, fashion, like it had everything that I wanted. Um, 
and then when I was applying to school, I grew up in a university town, so there was a chance that I was going to go to that university, but then I got into Columbia and I was like, game changer, <laughs> like I have to go. So yeah, I think like as much as I now love where I grew up, there was just something inside me where I was like, I have to move to a city where there are other people like me where I can be making art. I like didn't have a creative community and I had friends, but I didn't have enough that I like really could relate to on a fundamental level besides just like going to high school and getting a Slurpee during lunch, you know what I'm saying? So I just like felt like I needed so much more than that. And the other thing was that I like pretty much grew up on Flickr um, with, for photo stuff. And so I had like 30 friends who were all graduating high school the same year as me and moving to New York. And it was just so perfect. Like they were all going to art school and I wasn't, but like still being part of that photo community. The week that I moved here, I met like 15 people. And it was like, you have this immediate community of like IRL friends who you've known since you were, you know, 15 on the internet. So you've maybe known them for like three or four years, but you haven't met them yet. But yeah, it was just like, that was another big factor for me. I just knew that I would have people I could relate to. Olivia B is actually somebody I followed on Flickr for a really long time and then after I moved to New York I like messaged her on t Tumblr for something for some reason. Oh it was because I was working at Vice magazine one summer and her photos were in the photo issue and I messaged her being like hey saw your photos in the photo issue look dope and she was like hey I'm coming to New York in next month can I come stay with you I was like yes done and then we like became friends after that there's this boy Kenta Murakami who I knew from Flickr for a long time he doesn't live in New York but I met him here when he like came to visit um, he's from Seattle uh, Eleanor Hardwick who's from England um, I met her well I guess I actually met her in England um, Jesse Roth who went to NYU Sandy Honig who went to NYU Maiton Fazula who also went to NYU who else is there? Also, this girl that I became really good friends with at Columbia, we found out that we had been Flickr friends for a really long time, but we had just like kind of forgotten. This other girl, Esther Jung, I had known from Flickr. There's this amazing photo duo called Lisa, and it's a, a girl and a boy, Vanessa and Wilson, and I knew them from Flickr, and then Vanessa went to Barnard, and Wilson went to SVA, I think. And I thought that they were like 30 years old or something on the internet, and then they came to school, and they were both, they were both like my age, and I was like, oh my god, this is crazy! And they remembered me too. I had like started this group on Flickr called Blood Brothers, and it was photos of like people who were friends with each other. It was like photos of people together. And Wilson was like, I remember Blood Brothers, like we added all of our photos to that group. So there were just like so many little connections. Oh, a big one, Mike Bailey Gates was somebody I had known from Flickr, and I, he was one of the first people I met when I moved to New York. Him, Jordan Tiberio, Lauren Poor, and Tara Violet. We like all met, maybe like, I don't even think school had started yet. I was here for orientation and we all like Tumblr messaged each other and like set up a hang. There's so many people, it's like crazy. <laughs> I like started doing stuff for Rookie through Alyssa Johannes, also known as Your Pal Al. And um, we met, we actually met in a really funny way. So I'm a huge Patti Smith fan and so is Alyssa and so is Alyssa's um, friend from high school, Jake. And I went to a Patti Smith reading at the Barnes & Noble bookstore in Union Square. I think this was summer 2012, so I had been here for like just under a year. And I knew Jake from the internet. We weren't friends, but I'd like seen his photo and stuff. And I think I like followed him on Tumblr or something. And then I saw Jake and he was with Alyssa, who I didn't know at the time, at this reading. And I really wanted to go say hi, but I was like nervous and didn't do it. And then like the next day I messaged Jake on Tumblr and I was like, hey, I think I saw you at the Barnes and Noble Patty Smith thing. Um, do you want to hang out sometime? He was like, oh yeah, awesome. Like, I actually think I saw you two. Would love to hang out. So then he, Alyssa, and I all met up. And I can't remember what we did or where it was or anything, but like Alyssa and I just really clicked. I think it was over a mutual love of Justin Bieber. And um, 
Yeah, and then we just started hanging out a lot, and the first time that Alyssa and I hung out solo, she photographed me for a rookie shoot with Lauren Poor. And then from there on, like, we would just hang out, we would make photos and stuff together, and she, like, kept including me in her photo sets for Rookie. So, like, first I was modeling, and then I was, like, shooting with her. After about, like, maybe one and a half or two years of that, um, Tavi emailed me and was like, hey, we really like what you're doing with Alyssa. Do you want to start making stuff for us regularly? And then I became, like, a regular contributor. So I owe it all to Al. But yeah, that has been like an amazing community to be a part of. And I'm very thankful to like be somebody who was there kind of in the beginning. I guess like, yeah, I joined maybe like two or three years in. The first shoot I ever did for Rookie is one of my favorites actually. I like, um, do you know the movie Submarine? Okay, classic movie. Saw that sometime in high school and I feel like that resonates with anyone when they're a teenager and also I've been an Arctic Monkeys fan since I was like 12 years old. So to have like a full soundtrack by Alex Turner was almost too much for my weak little heart. Um, and like even when I watch that movie now, even though I'm like not 15 anymore, I, it's so moving. So I did a photo shoot inspired by that movie and I photographed my friend Fatima. Um, she lived in this beautiful apartment on I think like 106 and West end and um, I photographed her like spending a day inside all by herself and it was called All Right Hiding which is a name of one of the songs from the movie. I did that and then the majority of the stuff I've done for Rookie is all photos so I've done like a lot of photo editorials like more with a bent on fashion and like styling and stuff and then I've done a lot of photo diaries, which is fun because then it's just like stuff that I'm seeing in the city or wherever I'm going. And I've done a handful of illustrations for them too, which was like a fun little experiment because I always thought I was really bad at drawing. And then I was like, you know what, I'm gonna try this. And I liked this stuff and they published it and that was like really validating, you know? It just like made me feel good about my capabilities. For a while before we launched the new website, I was um, picking the background images for the website. So like every day there would be a new photo. And I did that for maybe like six months or something. That was really fun. I liked, I liked doing that a lot. Oh, and I do a lot of playlists for them, um, which I also love doing, so. I didn't really know who any photographers were when I started shooting. I knew like Ansel Adams, you know? Um, and I think like a lot of my work was informed by what was around me and not work that had been made prior. Because even in high school, like I didn't know anything about art history and like art history is such a thing that informs me now, but I didn't know that it was something that you could study. I like just had no idea that it was a field that existed. Um, I, yeah, I was really informed by like other work I was seeing on Flickr and the majority of my work when I first started, it was like 90% self portraiture. It was like, a, like just so many photos of me like playing these different characters in my backyard, in the basement, in my bedroom. And like, I look back at them now and some of them I like really cringe because some of them are kind of embarrassing, but I'm glad that I have, like I'm glad that that was something I made, you know, everybody goes through that. Movies informed my photos, I would say the most out of everything. Like, I remember taking a lot of photos inspired by The Virgin Suicides, which in retrospect is so funny to me. But that's like such a teenage movie and like specifically like, like teenage girl living in suburbia. Like I think that movie's set in Michigan and I'm one state south of it. So um, I remember taking a lot of photos with like that, like, you know, Sofia Coppola aesthetic in mind. In high school, I started looking at a lot more fashion photography and that started informing it a lot more. And I like got really into like menswear and male models specifically. Um, and like, I really loved Tim Walker and like Richard Avedon. But now I would say my work is a lot more informed by like William Eggleston, who is one of my all time favorites, like pioneer in color photography. Um, I also worship Allen Ginsberg and like a lot of people don't know him for his photos because he was a beat poet but his photography is amazing and he was one of those people who like he just like photographed things incessantly and I think that that is really inspiring to me like I also love Gary Winogrand who is a street photographer from like the 1950s um, maybe 
Um, and he did like all black and white New York City documentary and he shot a lot in LA. And he shot like 35,000 rolls of film or something in his life. Um, and I just, I love that like intense dedication to photo. And I like, that's something that I try to do. I don't know if I'll shoot <laughs> like 35,000 rolls of my life, but I like that like nonstop thinking about your work and like just looking at what's around you. I feel like that question kind of relates to like personal style and like what your style is when you're making art. And when you're young and still developing it, you like can't help but be sort of uh, motivated by and like inspired by movies like The Virgin Suicides or Submarine or like David Bowie music videos and stuff like that. So it's, it's not surprising to me that like the internet is so vast, but at the same time, like we all clung to very specific things and we were all in like different parts of the country doing that, you know what I'm saying? Like gravitating towards certain movies. Um, I was actually looking at like a bunch of the editorials I'd made for Rookie last year, a few days ago, and part of me was like, these kind of all look the same and I want to do something very different. So I think there's sort of like, everybody takes like the same ideas and creates their own thing with it. So there is like this thread that connects all of them. But then after a while, people, like everybody grows out of it. Like if you look at the work that like Eleanor Hardwick or Olivia B or Alyssa were making for Rookie in 2012, or even like Petra Collins. And if you look at that work, and then if you look at what they're doing now, like there are similarities, but everybody is like growing up and moving past, like ex ex holding on to things that they like clutched when they were younger, you know? Like I'll still watch The Virgin Suicides, I still love that movie, but I'm not gonna do any photo shoots inspired by it anymore, you know what I'm saying? Like that's something that I think when you hit a certain age, you're like, okay, I'm gonna move. One really great thing about Rookie is that the editors are like really lax about what you actually make. Like they give you just like so much scope and you get a lot of responsibility, which is nice. Like they'll give us the theme and then we pitch and then they accept whichever pitches they like. And then you can really run with it. And that has been nice because I have never felt confined by anything or I've never felt like, oh, I hope they like this or like, is this good enough for them? Um, and that, it, that's been great because then it allows all the contributors to experiment and like try something different and take a risk, even if it doesn't end up being like the most beautiful, perfect, whatever, like whether that's like a technical position or anything, you know, like especially with what I was saying with my illustrations, I like pitched a comic sometime last year and they liked it and I made it and I was like, this is not really that great, but I'm making it really earnestly. And I think that that's what people will connect to. And then like people really liked it and it made me feel great and it made other people feel great. And at the end of the day, like that's the point of a community like Rookie is to be able to spread positivity and like spread creativity and help other people. Every time we have like, we would have like a yearbook launch or any other get together. It just like felt so warm and whole and you like embrace these people who you technically don't really know, but because you know their work, you know a part of them, you know? So then you can have these conversations about work that they've made and work that you've made. So I, yeah, I feel like that community just fosters really amazing, like deep friendships. And I also think one of the reasons why Alyssa and I are so close is because Ricky allowed us to like make work together and learn about each other in that way. I think like, making friendships through art is really important and my best friend from high school or whatever since like I met her when I was two years old and we're so tight um, we always made art for each other growing up and like we would write each other notes and put them in lockers and then that kind of like turned into me photographing her all the time and she is an amazing um, like drawer and painter and stuff and like she would start making drawings for me and paintings and like even today she lives in a different part of the country than I do but we're like constantly like swapping art back and forth and yeah I just feel like that's such a nice way to be able to love someone is through making art. When I first moved to New York, I think I was making a lot of work about like living in New York City and like going to shows and like going to bars with a fake ID and like running around staying up late, all of that. And then 
I don't know when it happened, but I like took a shift that was actually a lot closer to the work I was making before I moved here, and it's a lot more about like quietness and. I always have like gravitated more towards photos that don't have people in them. I hesitate to call it landscape photography because it's not like a mountain or whatever, a sunset, but like the majority of my photos are like the, the photos that I like, that I like, that really mean something to me are photos that are devoid of any like real human presence. Um, I like I, portraiture is really important to me and it's something that I like do seriously, but I think that like the core of my work is photos that are just like nature buildings or like a dog or a cat or something. Like I love photographing my friends, pets. Um, and I think that like that quietness really connects to the surroundings that I had when I was growing up with like quiet streets, no cars. You can like ride your bike in the middle of the street. You can like walk barefoot. You don't have to lock your house, you know. We would like go out into the cornfields at 1 a.m. to look at stars and you don't have to worry about anybody like kidnapping you or anything. Whereas even at like 2 a.m. now in the city, I'm like, oh God, like stay alert. <laughs> but that just like wasn't something I had to do growing up. And I think like now that I have been out of the Midwest for almost five years, which is crazy to think, I like, really am feeling a closeness to it and like I want to go back to where I'm from and like make work about where I'm from and I think a lot of my work has to like now has to do with finding places in the city that don't look like the city and like finding places that look like the Midwest but they are in Manhattan or they're in Queens or Brooklyn or something and like that's I want to start doing that a little bit more like do series that are taken in and around the city like I went to New Jersey last fall and photographed this girl there and I like felt so connected to this random suburb like that one of my friends lived in and I had like taken the bus there once before so we just did it again and I want to make more work that's about that like connecting back to where I'm from. So I um, started interning for Noisy the summer after my freshman year of college and it happened in like a very goofy way. I was studying engineering and I hadn't written a paper or written anything like for a long time because I wasn't taking any writing classes really um, and or like any like liberal arts classes and uh, on campus we had like a media night thing where like people who worked in, in media companies came on campus and I met who was going to become my boss at Noisy and I like saw him wearing a name tag that said Vice and Noisy had launched one month before I met him so I like didn't really know what it was yet and I was like hey you work at Vice, I like Vice, can I talk to you? <laughs> so we spoke and then I don't even really remember what we spoke about. I think he told me about Noisy and how he was an editor there. And I was like, cool, are you guys hiring? And he was like, yeah, do you have a resume? I was like, yeah. So I gave him my resume and he took it. And on the way out, he like saw my school advisor um, and she went up to him and she was like, hey, I saw you talking to that girl. You should hire her. And so like, I, and he, and so I like emailed him a week later and I was like, hey, um, like what's the dealio for this summer? And he was like, yeah, do you want to like, do you want to work for me and I like I didn't know what noisy was I like had never done music journalism before I grew up playing classical music and like I loved going to concerts and stuff when I was in high school and I was doing that in the city so I like it wasn't totally out of the blue but I had never written about music and so I like just kind of got that job without an interview or anything and worked there all summer and it was probably the best internship experience I've ever had and it was it was also like the second internship I'd ever had so it was like crazy for it to be so good um, and yeah they had me like there was no grunt work which was nice like I never went out to get coffee the only errand I ever ran was to drop off someone's passport at the UN and like that's a crazy thing to let a 19 year old do um, but yeah I like interviewed a lot of great bands I got to interview um, Cody Critchlow from Shun, that was really cool. Um, I got to interview this uh, New York band called Skaters, who I love deeply, um, and I like got to photograph them at their show. And yeah, I got to like do little music reviews and write-ups and stuff. And I had so much responsibility and freedom, and I like made playlists for them. And then after the internship ended, I just like continued to work for them. And then 
like once I had made a bunch of work for them, I just, I had a portfolio that I was able to send to other places. So then I started uh, like interviewing for ID Magazine, which is also part of Vice now. And then I wrote for Wondering Sound when it was around and I did some stuff for The Wild Magazine. And I just kind of would like send my work out and be like, hey, can I interview this person for you? And it also was nice to like have writing and photo because then the publication doesn't have to like send out another person and like you know you can like be your own right hand man so that has been cool to like be involved in both sides and when I was younger I like loved to write and I never did it through school but I would like write poems and like really goofy stuff and I also like I wrote a lot of prose and I made a lot of collages that had text and image and so to be able to like continue to do that in a different way with like text as an interview and then image as photographing the person, um, yeah, I just, I love to mix mediums like that. When I was in high school I never read Vice News or anything, I would just look at their photos and they had this like network of bloggers who I would, who like did photo, who I would follow. So I never was like reading anything that they were publishing, which probably for the better, like when I was that young. Um, and then I came to New York and like honestly when I met Ben, my editor on campus, and he was wearing the Vice name tag, I like, I recognized Vice, but I didn't know like the extent to like how big it was, because it's a like, media conglomerate you know what i'm saying like they do everything they have a record label like they do fashion music sports like now they have they have so many like little child channels now they have like an edm channel or vertical or whatever and then they have broadly and then they have munchies it's like it's huge um and when i was there in 2012 they were still at like their older offices because in the past three years they have expanded greatly i mean they've taken over williamsburg we all know it um and I thought everybody there was really cool and I thought at first that I wasn't cool enough and then I was like, you know what, you're definitely cool enough, it's fine. <laughs> like so, so much of that is just like a look and at the end of the day, like if you're making good work, that's what's important. And I think that everybody who I was working with at the time was like super hard worker, really motivating and like I had two bosses, Ben and Sasha and Sasha was a year older than me and she like quit college or whatever like dropped out of college and then got hired by noisy and was an editor there and i found that so motivating to see somebody who's like maybe 20 or 21 years old and be the youngest person who's employed by them i love that and i love my current editor at vice now as well her name is kim taylor bennett and like she used to work i think for like bbc radio one or something and now she does stuff for noisy and she does stuff at Vice. Everybody who I met there was also doing other stuff in other departments and I really liked that you didn't have to be pigeonholed because at the time since I was I was studying industrial engineering I like was only doing that all the time and I was really afraid that when I graduated it was it would like be the only thing that I could do or something and to see somebody who like was an editor in the music department but then was like going out on shoots and like producing other content at the same publication was really cool. It just like gave me hope that you can do multiple things at any given time, so yeah. I know a lot of people shit on them, but I had like a really good experience with that, so yeah, I like, totally want people to know. <laughs> That was one thing that I would talk to my dad about a lot, like kind of in the beginning when I moved here, I'd be like, are things happening to me because I'm a brown person and like they need the token brown person for diversity. And I feel like that's just something that you carry with you when you're a minority and like you hope that it's not true. But yeah, I used to, and, like even when I got into Columbia, I like thought a lot of it was because I was a person of color. I was like, do they need like, is that why I'm here? I feel like that's, yeah, I feel like that's just something that like like, kind of weighs on you in like the back of your head with everything and then I feel like I've kind of gotten over it now because like I have a lot of friends who are non-white and but but I mean that's still like a topic of discussion you know I feel like everywhere that I've worked so far like the core ethos have sort of been the same and like when I started at noisy I wasn't really thinking about like I wasn't really motivated by my brownness necessarily the way that I am today. And like one really cool thing about Rookie is that when I started photographing for them, 
um, my editor Lena was like, hey, we really want you to find a, like a model who's a person of color for this shoot. And then from there on out, like pretty much every editorial I've done for them is all people of color. And that is so important to me. Um, and especially with like working in the fashion industry, like there's just such a lack of people of color and like everything that you see in campaigns, runway, editorial, whatever, like 95% of the time it's a white person, whether that's a male or a female. And so like being able to involve myself as a person of color and other models who are people of color and just like, I feel like I'm like injecting that into everything and I'm completely shameless about it because it's, it's just like so important. And one thing that I've noticed is that like, people respond really well to seeing people of color, especially on Rookie, because like so many of our readers are non-white and living in small towns that might be mostly white, which is like the community that I kind of grew up in. And just to like be, to see, be able to see somebody who looks like you, which is I feel like something that we say all the time, but it like <laughs> bears repeating that it's so important to see people who look like you, whether that's like skin tone or gender presentation or like, anything that renders you as an oppressed minority being able to see people like that who are just doing well or like in the public eye is so important and it makes you feel like you can go do that thing whatever it is you know yeah. like if i had grown up seeing brown people in magazines i feel like i would have felt less ashamed of who i was you know and i would feel like I wouldn't have felt embarrassed by my brownness or something, but like now I don't want to do anything but embrace it. You know what I'm saying? You've, I don't know. And like I feel like today a lot more mainstream magazines are starting to include people of color, but um, it's not there fully yet. <laughs> so if somebody is like against that, I don't want anything to do with them. So. <laughs> interesting that you said generational because like the way that my my parents were both born in India and moved here so my brother and I are first generation born here and like the way that they see being a non-white person living in this country versus the way that my brother and I see it is totally different like for them it's a lot about assimilating and like holding on to your culture but still just kind of like just go about your day and for me I'm like so much more loud about it and I like want to yell about it and I want to educate people about it and I don't want to be quiet and I don't want to listen to like neo-colonialists you know what I'm saying but like they grew on they like grew up under colonialism so their relationship to that is so different and it's just it's been so interesting to like watch them develop that versus me or certain things like uh, like where my parents grew up in India, like it's a, like the United States, it's like a strong patriarchy. And I take a lot of issue with that and I make a lot of noise about it and they'll be like, well, we can't do anything. I'm like, well, I'm not just gonna sit here and like let women be oppressed because that's the way that it's happened, you know? And not to say that my parents like aren't feminists or something, but I feel like they're sort of at the point where they, it was just something that they were used to and they didn't necessarily want to challenge it the way that like my generation wants to challenge it. I honestly, I don't really know where that comes from. I think that's just kind of how I see things and like, I, yeah, I think it does come like from my relationship with people or with things and like, I feel like when I'm photographing something, I want it to feel intimate, but for, well, I guess it depends on what it is, but I usually do. But I mean, at the same time, like I am outside of whatever's happening. Like fundamentally as a photographer, having a camera there totally changes the landscape, whether it's people or whether it's just like, even when you're just in the woods, like having this machine there changes the way that the environment looks, you know? Um, but yeah, I think like when I'm photographing people especially, I don't really like to direct them that much I mean, and I would rather just shoot as if they knew that I didn't have a camera. So a lot of the times like I'll take pictures of like people and their backs are turned to me because they don't know that I'm taking the shot or I'll be like walking behind them and I'll like yell out their name and they'll turn around and I'll snap. You know what I'm saying? It's like. I don't necessarily want to catch them off guard, but I also don't want them to change themselves because I have a camera. Um, one thing that that kind of makes me think of is when I go to India, which is like, I go pretty often with my family, 
I take my Fuji, which is like this big. And a lot of people there in the like town that we visit, they don't really recognize it as a camera necessarily. Like they, they don't see it as a thing like, oh, this person is gonna come take my picture. So that allows me to like very quietly just like move quickly and shoot and be able to get the photo the way that I see it in that moment. Like, I have a lot of photos of pictures of my grandparents where like, they didn't know that I was taking the photo because if they did know, they would be like, don't take this picture of me, I don't look good. And like one of my very favorite pictures is um, this picture of my grandpa a, a few months before he passed away, like him sitting on his favorite chair, looking out the window at like something that he would always do, just like out onto the balcony. And it wasn't like a special moment for him at all, but it was so special for me. And I like cherish that so much. So being able to just like take, like make these little moments and be able to hold on to them, um, I honestly, it's kind of selfish because it's more about me and it's less about the person in the picture, but whatever. <laughs> That's the way that I do it. I think one thing that I think like anybody my age who's grown up the way that I have in relationship to art and the internet would say that's universal is that it just like has been such a great like tool of democracy, just allowing anybody to make anything and put it out there. Um, and that's what I value it most for. I think the one thing that has been kind of bad is that it has spurred a lot of copycats and like that can be kind of frustrating or a lot of the time your work can be taken out of context. Like you lose the caption, you lose the credit, which freaking sucks. That's like every artist's nightmare is to have uh, 10,000 notes on Tumblr and like not have your name or your website connected to it. Um, so that I think has been kind of, I, it's a double-edged sword, you know what I'm saying? Um, but also like in, in for me, most of the art that I look at or that I'm very fond of is like not really art that was produced and then put on the internet. Um, and I think it's because everything that I learned about in school when I was studying art history was all like pre-1800s. Like I really focused on goth Gothic architecture from the 1200s and like 12 to 1400s. And then I learned, I like really love ancient Chinese, Japanese and Korean art. And then I love like French Impressionism. So everything that I'm really inspired by and like work that is in a totally different medium that inspires me is like <laughs> not work that was made when the internet was around. But then there is so much photography that's happening right now that was, you know, that is meant to be shared on the internet or meant to be shared in a gallery or something. And I'm really inspired by all of that as well. Like basically art that all my friends are making with photo or art that people who are my age. It's just nice to be able to see young people who are making work and not worrying about like impressing anyone and it's just like this is what I am and this is like things that I see and things that I make and I hope you like it and I hope it brings something nice into your life and if it doesn't like that's fine you can well I'll just keep moving on well can I tell you about a project that I am working on cool that I do have the time and don't need any money for um, <laughs> Well, so one thing I was talking about earlier was like representing people of color in fashion photography. And that was something that I was doing like really heavily for Rookie last year. And like now I'm working on more editorials for other magazines um, and like trying to include people of color regardless of their gender, or, like skin tone or whatever. Just, But like now one thing that I am working on setting up uh, shoots for is like shooting more gender non-conforming people and like more agender people because that's how I see myself and that's how I have been like presenting myself lately and I think for all artists the work that you make is a reflection of who you are at that time and like last year I was really focused on POC issues especially in like representation and now I'm like definitely still focused on that but like want to focus more on like gender non-conforming and like agender non-binary people and so now I'm working on like contacting people who are non-conforming to ask if I can photograph them and like so far I have a few shoots set up for the next month that I'm really excited about and like hope that I can like hope that it helps change someone's life out there because I think that's another thing with like when I was growing up, I like thought that I had to present as female because that's how I saw, especially being South Asian, like 
if you're born female, you have long hair and you tie it in a braid, you know what I'm saying? Like that's just the way that you do it, especially in India. I've like never, I've seen like maybe one woman with short hair or one like, one person who was born as a woman who has short hair, you know what I'm saying? So working on that right now is really important to me. And like, ideally I would love to go like in terms of like not having money and stuff, it would be great to be able to travel more and shoot other people in different parts of the country. Cause I feel like living in New York, it's really easy to be like, this is the entire world and like everything happens here. But this is like one little speck in the entire earth. And there are so many other people who are making incredible art and like so many other people who are living these amazing lives, whether they're like in a tiny village or they're in a big city somewhere, they like live on a like tea farm, you know what I'm saying? I haven't really done that many gallery stuff and I think as like somebody who primarily displays their stuff on a screen, it would be great to be able to print my work more. Um, I've been in maybe like three gallery shows, but I would love to be involved with that more because like the feeling of getting your photo printed is just so cool to see it from being like this tiny thing like on your cell phone or your computer to like, you know, a big like eight by 11 or something, or that's not even that big, like 11 by 17 or something big. <laughs> um, I just made a print for my friend for her birthday and I like wanted to keep it. I was like, this looks great <laughs> but that would be cool I've been in a few zines and I would love to do that more I think more like tangible stuff would be cool yeah and I'm working on I like made a zine last year with my work and a bunch of my friends work and this year I want to put out a poetry zine of just like a bunch of stuff that I've written with maybe some photos in it as well so yeah that's one good thing about the internet is that you can just like make a little thing and print some and if people like it they can buy it you don't even have to know who they are so and it can be really cheap too which is cool well I'll give you an Allen Ginsberg quote that I love um, there I read so there was this journalist who passed away a few years ago uh, named Matt Powers and right after he passed away I read this piece that he had written about him meeting Allen Ginsberg and like developing a friendship with him and one thing that Alan told him towards the end of his life, like Matt asked him, what should I write about? And Alan Ginsberg said, write about your love for your friends. And I kind of have taken that and morphed it into my own thing of just like make work about your love for your friends or your love for people you don't know, for your love for things that you see. And I think that like a lot of my work is motivated by seeing something and just finding some sort of emotional attachment to it, whether it's like a tree or my grandpa or my best friend or like whatever, it can be inanimate, it can be a building, like my love for a cathedral, it can be anything. And I think that's what I'm really inspired by is just being able to see and experience something and then make a photo of it so that I can look at it later and continue to cherish it and I can share it with people um, and you know give them some positivity or even just like, I think just being able to elicit some sort of emotional reaction, something visceral is important to me. And like, I always say that the biggest compliment that anybody can give me is when they say that something that I've made makes them cry. Like cry in a sad way, cry in a happy way, just like to be so moved by something. Like that's what I'm so flattered by and that's what I want to continue to do. So yeah.